meeting is being recorded. Don't let it go much past like 7.03, Brian. I think, you know, people will load in pretty quickly. Okay. Okay, it's uh, seven. I'm going to start it now. Okay. Hello and welcome to Fireman's Hall Museum's membership meeting. Give us just a few minutes for any late members that may be joining. I'll be starting in just a minute. Those just joining, we're going to start in just a few minutes, waiting for any latecomers. We will be starting momentarily, just giving a few minutes for any latecomers that are joining. Thank you. All right. Hello and welcome to Fireman's Hall Museum's Membership Night. I'm your host, Firefighter Brian Anderson, the curator of Fireman's Hall Museum. Tonight's presentation is going to be very special. We're going to revisit one of the worst fires in Philadelphia, which was the Fretz Fire. It was a 12 alarm fire and Commissioner Maccabee was the commissioner at that time and George Hink was the chief of the department. Joining us tonight will be the grandson of past commissioner Hank, Mike Hank, and Mike Pence, who is a lifelong fire buff. As one of our many jobs that we did reflecting 150 years of the department, we went and developed the, the bios of all the past leadership of the Philadelphia Fire Department. If you look at the screen now, you can see this reflects the leadership of Commissioner George E. Hink, and it gives you a bio of him as commissioner at that time. And at this time, I would like to, to introduce Mike Hink, the grandson of Commissioner Hink. And Mike, if you wanna come on and just talk a little bit about your grandfather, and we will watch a video that's going to uh, view an uh, interview with both Commissioner Maccabee and past Commissioner Hank and show bits of the Pretz fire. Mike. Thanks, Brian. And thank you, Lisa, for putting this show together. Uh, looking forward to the evening. Uh, just a little background on Pop Hank. Uh, 
He was a firefighter for 44 years in the city. Um, began his career in August of 1921. And I believe it was with Engine 24 down south in the southern part of the city. Um, rising through the ranks to uh, 1940 when he became a battalion chief in the 6th Battalion, uh, where he was um, there for 12 years before being elevated to, uh, to uh, fire, Deputy Fire Commissioner and Chief of Department. Um, it's great because we all lived in the same house up in, uh, well, some people call it Kensington, some people call it Fishtown, right on York Street. Um, our family of uh, my mom, dad, and five children lived with Pop and, and our grandmother in the same house, along with uh, my Aunt Mary and Uncle Bud and their family. So it was, as my grandfather always called it, the crazy house. Um, he never wanted to leave the house because he felt it was centrally located and he could make his runs to the, to the Exelon fires uh, throughout the city from that location. He kept his car over at Engine 25, which is over on Haggard Street. And um, he was he was totally passionate about the job that he, that he was involved in. In fact, um, just real quick, I got a few th items I want to share. So my father was writing a little story about him. And um, so many, many times Pop came home, his eyes red and swollen, his lungs congested with smoke, hardly able to see or breathe. Mom would put him to bed, cover him with blank, piles of blankets, open the windows all the way, and give him the fresh air treatment. In no time at all, Pop was in shape again, ready to go. And I think reading something like that from the 40s um, gives us an idea what firemen went through back before they had such better equipment that they have today. Um, brought along, uh, real quick, there's the helmet he wore at the Fred's fire. Okay, that's the last helmet he had. And uh, crazy thing I shared with the Earl earlier, the wool gloves that they used to fight a fire back in the day. These were the gloves that were in the helmet. So probably the last fire he went to. Um, I, I was very fortunate as a young kid to go to several fires with him. I got to ride in the chief car, as, as did my brothers. Um, it was great, a, a re very rewarding family atmosphere for us. Um, so the TV show we're about to see, so Pop, Pop was very familiar, very uh, engaged with the beginnings of television in the city. The 1950s and 60s with TV becoming so prevalent, um, I think he was considered good, good TV because he was engaging, he was smiling all the time. They loved to the interview him for fires. And, and then when they were done with the film, they just gave him the film. They, they didn't keep it archived. So we, we had boxes and boxes of film, which I had put on to DVDs, thanks to Harry McGee, who introduced me to people that would do that. Um, so the video that we're gonna to see tonight is, um, is done by WCAU, which was channel 10 at the time. And it was a 30 minute TV show and it explores what happened at the fire and how they, how they investigated it and so forth. Um, personally, our recollections, my family, my dad, who was a battalion chief, actually my dad was in the sixth battalion, but he was off that day. And I believe the fire chief at the time, battalion six was Joe Fortunato who pulled the second alarm and so forth. So our family was in, was in New Jersey visiting relatives on my mom's side. In the car, we had a two-way fire radio and across the uh, radio came the fire and my dad heard it. And um, it was like, well, we're gonna go. So I was, in, I was five years old. I can vividly remember walking, once my dad parked the car out in North Philly there near the fire, walking down this dark street and we made this right turn and all we saw was just just fire it was a huge fire so my dad said let's go and we, we turned around and went back to the house where he got his equipment he went down to fight the fire which i think back in that day you just went to the fires even if you were off um pop hink the fire chief he was home with my oldest brother vic and grandma and they were watching believe it or not joe namath in the sugar bowl playing for alabama uh, when he got the call and um, he got himself together and my brother Vic, we would always go to the roof of the house there on York street and look for the, look in the direction, see if you could see the fire and Vic came down and reported, Hey, you, you can see it from here already. So they knew they had a pretty bad fire going in. So um, it was quite an eventful evening uh, in my mind. I can still picture so many things about that evening. So um, Brian, if you're ready to roll the video, we could go right to video if you'd like.
Sure. At this time, I'd like to respectfully ask all my viewers to please hold your questions and answers to the end. The video is roughly about 33 minutes, and there will be some low parts of volume, but it will adjust. Thank you for your patience and enjoy. Hold on one second, folks. We're trying to adjust the volume. Sorry for that. At 5.17 p.m. And then, and then the response to that original alarm was four engine companies. Shortly. I'm sorry, folks. We're going to restart this. Also, this we have uh, extra apparatus. Well, ...are directed to a blaze. The lights on this map, never before seen on television, indicate what equipment and what manpower has been dispersed. Fire Commissioner Frank McNamee and Chief George Hink recreated the events of that New Year's Day for our cameras. He's concerned. True. At the time, we had such a tremendous response to a 12-alarm fire. Yes. Was the rest of the city naked as far as fire protection is concerned? Or uh, what was the condition? And I'm happy to advise you that the we've got in Philadelphia a prearranged plan where we have a skip system that will be shown here shortly. And two also, we have uh, extra apparatus that is put into uh, uh, service, of course, with uh, proper manpower at such time as we have such a big fire as this. And then two, uh, there are some companies in the city that have two pieces of equipment. Yes. And if both of those, as they do, respond to the fire and as early as is possible, we permit one of those companies to return. For instance, down at Engine Ford, 15th and Sansom. 
One of those companies came back so that it covered the local situation while the fire was still on. It's a real backup system. Oh, yes. Then, too, also, as early as is possible from the fire, we return companies that may become available as soon as they can be spared so that the entire town is wholly covered uh, and that if uh, a fire should occur, and talking about if a fire should occur, 40 fires did occur during the time this fire was going on. Uh, Chief, could you take us now back to the time? The first alarm was struck. Yes, the first alarm bell was struck from Box 95 at 12th and Susquehanna Avenue at 5.17 p.m. And then, and then the response to that uh, original alarm was four engine companies, two ladder companies, and two battalion chiefs. The yeah. fire was right here. Right, right there. Now, that is the first alarm response. Then the second Immediately alarm. on arrival, the battalion chief in charge uh, struck, uh, ordered the second alarm at 519. That was only two minutes later. That is right. Mm -hmm. He responded from 7th to Norris at just about a minute run, and he immediately re uh, asked for a second and a third alarm at 523. It was pretty apparent uh, that this was a sizable fire. Yes, indeed. The third alarm at 523. Yes. The Deputy Chief O'Drain, responding on the third alarm, on the, on the uh, second alarm, arrived and struck the fourth alarm at 529, which brought an additional four engine companies, a chief, and a ladder. At 530, one minute later than the fourth, the fifth alarm was struck. And it's interesting to see the pattern of where this equipment is now coming from. Yeah, you will notice, too, that uh, that some of the lights are out. And that is uh, our, the bypass system, uh, which uh, we inaugurated in the Philadelphia Fire Department. And I ordered the sixth and seventh alarms, 533 and 535, the eighth alarm and ninth alarm, 537, 559, and then uh, the tenth alarm at 603. At this time, the, the fire was completely out of control. There was a firestorm developing, and it was then necessary to strike the 11th alarm at 621 and the 12th alarm at 628 p.m. To further trace the story of this fire, we've come to the desk in the office of Deputy Fire Commissioner George Hink. Chief, when was it that you first heard about this fire? I was notified by, uh, I was at home, and I was notified that the second alarm was in for the Fred's building at Tenth of Diamond. I advised him to send my driver that I was going to take it in. Mm -hmm. And uh, this Fred's building was not unknown to you, was it? No, uh, I, I worked uh, as battalion chief in that, uh, in the 6th battalion district for 12 years before I became chief of department, so that I was quite familiar with the Fred's building and its contents. What was the... Uh what was the building material? What was the building made of? This was a red brick uh, 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 mill type construction with wooden beams and wooden floors, many partitions, and uh, with many occupancies, uh, a good deal of them of a hazardous uh, nature. But it was the building itself that had put fear into the hearts of fire officials from the time of almost the time that it was constructed. It was a huge building, almost two squares long, and it was at, always considered a threat to the fire department. The only good part about the whole thing was that we knew that it was covered with sprinklers, adequately covered. We've had many uh, alarms of fires in the building, some of the molly alarm fires, but with the aid of the sprinklers, we were always able to control the fires. So you arrived on the scene not knowing whether you were really just going to get there and turn around and go home, or what was going to happen? I arrived, I, I ordinarily do not go on a second alarm, but I took this fire in because of the nature of the building. Uh, uh, on arrival, it was, uh, uh, I knew that we had a major fire on our hands, and after a quick size up and uh, consultation with the assistant chief and uh, the other uh, chief officers present, why uh, we knew that we had a, a runaway fire. We knew we had a potential conflagration on our hands. When the, uh, when the building, when the wall started to fall and this uh, fireball, this firestorm developed, and this uh, was a, uh, 
was the thing that put fear into the hearts of all of those present, the drafts, the updrafts of the air being sucked in, and the explosions as the fire developed, and the firestorm itself getting growing in intensity every minute, uh, 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 presaged what just did happen. We knew that something terrible was going to happen, and when the walls went in, it would have been then too late to evacuate uh, large areas, and I'm afraid that uh, we may have lost many lives if we hadn't been prepared for what did occur. Um. What is a fire storm? You, you've used that term several times. Uh, this, uh, this fire was of such uh, great proportions that, uh, as fires do under these circumstances, they then create their own draft and they draw in the cool air at the bottom, suck it up, and this seems to increase the intensity uh, of the fire so that the huge fireball develops which rolls and and which could very well under certain conditions come down closer to the earth so that anything it touches it will ignite i feel sure there had been large buildings in that area that they too would have been enveloped because when this heat was so intense that we had buildings in back of us to the rear of us suddenly enveloped with in flames spontaneously so that we'd have to turn our or deluge guns onto those buildings. And uh, honestly, it's thrilling to think of how the officers and the men, firemen worked. Uh, they worked without thought of their own safety. They gave everything they had. The spirit the Corps was just tremendous for to be able to get through this without the loss of any lives. And of course, this is our purpose. When these trucks do respond to an alarm, they're told to take up a position. They don't just come to the fire and uh, they're ordered to a specific area? Thanks to radio, Bill, following the third alarm, I was able to direct the response of all of the companies coming in so that they could take advantage of the high pressure system and then lead off with adequate water supply and we had battalion chiefs then ready to meet them and place them into position. This building uh, uh, was a sprinkler building. And we did not know that the sprinklers had been, the sprinkler system had been frozen and closed down. And I'll say this, Bill, had that fire occurred with a sprinkler system in operation, that might have been a two or a three alarm fire but this great fire would not have occurred so that we should take advantage of our fire protective equipment that's available to us, sprinkler systems, the proper kind of extinguishers, and the other things that are available to prevent fire or hold down the spread of fire, we shouldn't take them away because fire is a dreadful thing and it can cause much property loss and many lives and injuries. This shouldn't happen again. Steaming, smoldering, charred ruins. Desolation. Stark remains of what once was. Dangerous remains of the Fretz building. was an eight-story factory. These were stores. This was a car. This was a street. These were homes. 
Miraculously, no one was killed. But what saved the residents? And what will happen to them now? And to try and bring you the full story, we've come to the offices of Water Commissioner Baxter, who is also the Emergency and Disaster Coordinator. Mr. Baxter, thank you very much for <coughs> sharing your time with us. I know it's a very busy time for you. What was the... Uh, beginning of this story as far as you were concerned? First, the beginning of it was the uh, start of the fire itself and the fact that the fire had developed into a real major conflagration and particularly that the fire had caused a lot of people to be evacuated from their homes and later on uh, some of those homes were destroyed. Largely these people were your responsibility then, weren't they? Uh, these, the people were my responsibility as, the, as a coordinator, although the overall operation is the assignment that actually has been given to me to coordinate and to direct where necessary all of the various functions. Uh, I would point out very hurriedly that uh, from the standpoint of the various departments in the city, uh, they all know what to do. Uh, I don't have to tell the fire chief or the police chief or any of these other people uh, how to do their own individual job. They know how to do it. Uh, but the general coordination and particularly handling uh, people who have to be evacuated from their homes is is an assignment that I have. Yeah. The police actually did the evacuation. Getting the people out of their houses was done by the police and by some of the early firemen, of course, who were working directly at the yeah. fire. What has happened now with these people who have been evacuated? What was the first thing that you did? These uh, poor people uh, saw their homes and their belongings either going up in flames or being so badly damaged as to not be able to inhabit them again. What became of these people? One of the things we found, Bill, as far as people are concerned in fires of this sort, and we have uh, fires maybe a four or five a year in which a fair number of people are put out of their houses, that everybody wants to be looking at the fire while it's going on. Uh, it's very hard to collect them and get them together at the height of the fire. But uh, in our overall organization for emergencies and disaster, we have used the Red Cross uh, as the agency to uh, take care of people, to house them, and to give them relief. Uh, in this case, uh, sometime, perhaps, uh, uh, I've lost track of the time, but perhaps within an hour uh, after the fire started or after I got in there, uh, we called the Red Cross and said this is a, an emergency area to get up uh, and set up their emergency procedures. In this case, it was decided, uh, all as a part of a prearranged plan, uh, that we would put the people up at the Majestic Hotel of Broad and Gerard Avenue. And uh, I think that night, uh, my recollection of the numbers are not exactly, may not be exactly correct, that we had uh, somewhere between 35 and 40 rooms at the Majestic Hotel. Each room had at least two people in it, and depending on the size of the family or the number of children, there were uh, more. TV 10 reporter John Parsons visited some of the fire victims on the night of the fire to determine their impressions. Well, how are things with you now? Same way. Got nothing. Where were you when the fire started? I was in the house. In my house. Did you have any insurance or anything on the house? Yes, I did, but I, uh, I left everything in there. I don't need this much, no. I don't know nothing. Yes, I have insurance. Books that burn up. Don't know. We are so excited. We don't just don't know the name of the insurance. All excited. Is all of your family uh, around the dinner table? Are you preparing the New Year's no, meal? I started to prepare it, but they wasn't around the table. They was in there undressing the tree. How did they react? They grabbed their things and they started to cry. Some of them, they went outside, and we all went outside. So. Did you manage to get anything out of the house before the no, fire? No, not nothing. 
How many children in your family? Well, I ain't got, but I got a grown son and a grandson I'm raising. And me and my husband, four of us are now. I don't know what to do. What were you doing when the, the news of the fire spread? Well, I had done cook my dinner and walked out. And I had went around a friend of mine. And uh, when we, some of the kids and her kids run in, it says the factory was on the fire. Then we rushed out, and I rushed down there and I got there. My husband was, they had chased him out the house, and uh, he didn't have no coat on or nothing. And so I had on what I've got on now. That's all I saved. And so they wouldn't let us back around there. They wouldn't let us in. So there wasn't nothing to do. I went to the school, and they sent us to the school, and they sent us down here. Okay. Oh, where were you when the, the fire broke out? I was in the house getting ready to go out to take the family for a drive. They'd already gone out and got a new car. How'd they react to the news? <laughs> it excited them. And then I drove them away about two blocks, you know, to get out where I figured it was safe. Were you able to grab anything? No, we didn't get anything other than just what we had on our back. How many children in the family? Seven. How do you feel about the future right now? I don't have much idea. It looks pretty rough. Ebenezer Baptist Church has been designated as the Red Cross Center, and clothes have just been pouring in here for those who have been displaced because of the fire. This is the Reverend Spear, pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, and could you tell us something about the number of clothes that have come in here? Uh, more than 5,000 pieces of clothing have come in since the night of the disaster. And uh, the people have been most responsive. Uh, while the headquarters is here, uh, people of all walks of life have uh, responded very, very, very well to the appeals. The Red Cross has its uh, temporary quarters here, and uh, but we are gratified at the responses of all of the people of the community and the city. Chairman of our board, Benjamin Johnson and Roebuck Robinson, chairman of our trustee board, opened the church. I was out of the city when it happened, mm -hmm. and uh, since the night of the disaster, the church has been opened for the victims. With me at the table at the moment are Deputy Commissioner for Fire Prevention, William J. Eccles, and Battalion Chief Fire Marshal, William Connolly. Thank you, gentlemen, both, uh, for being good enough to sit down. Let's explore this a little bit more, if we might. First of all, uh, Commissioner Eccles, uh, how do you go about uh, investigating this, this type of a fire? Well, Bill, you, uh, you go about investigating this type of a fire uh, similar to what you would investigate any other type of a fire. There's a starting point, and uh, many times we hope a closing point. Uh, in all fires, you start off by attempting to find out where the fire started, uh, any witnesses or passers-by who observed the fire in its incipient stage, what they saw at that time. Uh, we talk to the first two in firemen who were first on the scene, and they tell us what they observed. All of these things help us. Uh, we try to eliminate as much as we can accidental causes, and if we're able to, we then try to establish a motive for something other than an accidental fire. In this particular fire, we were fortunate in coming up with what we believe is a definite cause for the fire. We know exactly where the fire started from the conversations we have with the first in firemen and their superior officers. We have eyewitnesses who observed the fire in its incipient stage and where the majority of the heavy fire was at the beginning. So from these things, we had a pretty good starting point. Uh, we then talked to occupants of the building, neighbors in and around the area in the neighborhood, uh, uh, people who work in the building, and from this we were able to, what we think, establish a very solid, distinct, definite cause for this fire. When do the fire marshals begin their investigation? Immediately, uh, all fire marshals are called immediately on sec uh, extra alarm fires. The first alarm comes in, then the second alarm would come in. The fire dispatcher immediately num notifies the assistant fire marshal on duty that night, plus notifying me. We immediately respond to the area where the fire uh, occurred, and we immediately get into the investigation 
That's correct. Even while the, the blaze is going that is, on. That is correct. Beginning your investigation. That is correct. In the interest of fire prevention, of course, the best fire is one that never starts. But after they get started, then you have to find out something about them. It's important that we can establish a cause for a fire, Bill, because from the causes of fires that we established, uh, comes uh, possible amendments and modifications to the existing fire code. Yes. I know that there's just nothing but a, a mess of bricks up there at the moment. How, how did you uh, piece together this information that you have that you feel is reasonably certain as to how the fire started? Well, I can start by saying that the area in which the fire originally started, strangely enough, was one of the few pieces of the building that was still standing. Uh, two, we talked to the plant maintenance man who knew the building from top to bottom, knew it from memory from working in there, uh, I would think that uh, at this time that you might want to ask Fire Marshal Connolly just how he established the cause of this fire. Yeah, Bill, how did you? Uh, well, he immediately, like I told you that night, we responded to the fire and we worked there all evening. The next morning we assigned two assistant fire marshals to that particular fire due to the extent of it. Uh, we uh, found that there was 14 occupants in the, the building. Uh, the owner, the maintenance man, we talked to them all, every one of them. We came up with three eyewitnesses that saw the fire start, and particularly the area that it started in. Also, after talking to the maintenance man, we came up with a possible uh, cause for this fire. And what is that, may I ask? Well, uh, we come to the conclusion right at the present time, uh, the maintenance man there had uh, a series of breakdowns in his sprinkler system, and uh, he uh, went up into the penthouse of the elevator uh, shaft. Uh, he had two 15,000 gallon water tanks uh, on the roof and uh, he went up there to close off the valves. Uh, he, uh, while he was up there, he's a man that he claimed he was sick and he took up a portable heater with him. And he attached it to uh, the electric current of the elevator shaft. Uh, but he had, didn't you plug it into a receptacle. He used uh, uh, just a makeshift hookup by taking it into uh, the electric line and the ground line and uh, uh, just to get warm and he left it on there for approximately over 17 hours and uh, we definitely established that uh, as a cause of the fire due to the fact that we picked up an eyewitness that saw where the fire had broken out also when the first battalion chief arrived in there he uh, he puts it in a definite the same definite area that the, the portable heater had been attached to she I think it's amazing that you're able to uh, get this much information and get it so quickly to tell you that the, this portable electric heater was placed on a splintered wooden floor, which was at the top of the elevator shaft, immediately underneath the two 15,000 gallon water supply tanks for the sprinkler system. And that the, uh, the headers uh, abutting into this building abutted into the extending part of the other building, and it was a path, oh, I guess, of an area about two feet in depth, I guess, through which this fire, once it started, yes. from the heater being overheated, burning through this wooden floor, just transmitted itself through this air tunnel, you might call it, into the adjoining building, at which time it was a, it was a mass of fire on the upper floors at the arrival of the firemen. Hmm. I think you two fellows and the entire, the entire fire department are to be congratulated for coming up with such a quick fix in such a short period of time. Well, uh, we, uh, we tried. We've been working on it night and day, definitely since the fire started. And uh, I might add this, that that fire evidently was a delayed alarm that probably was cooking up for quite some time before it did break out and was discovered by the eyewitnesses. And it was in the area where I had, we had spoken about the eyewitnesses discovering it. And we had more than one mm -hmm. eyewitness to the fact that the fire started in that area. It's only through uh, work, uh, such as the fellows in the department, as you do, uh, and by disseminating this information to the public at large that we can help to prevent another Fretz fire. Uh, perhaps the lesson to be learned is expensively and yet not so dearly learned since we lost no lives in the entire situation. That's Thanks. probably the most fortunate thing about an unfortunate fire, Bill. Indeed so. No fire ever really has to happen, does it? Well, well there's no such thing as a good fire in the, in the terms of the fire department. We, we like, as you said in the beginning, the best fire is the one that doesn't occur, and that's what we try to do. Yeah. We're not always successful, but that's what we try to do. Good. Thanks to both of you. Thank you.
Well, this is the very worst fire in my experience, and uh, I have quite a history on the paid fire department. I'm sure this is the greatest fire that we've ever experienced. How worried were you that this might spread through? Well, North I, I really was worried because the potential uh, was here for a uh, for a fire to the firestorm, and there was every potential for a uh, runaway fire. Would you say that uh, this fire had a definite cause, and why did it happen? Uh, I would believe, and from what we've learned, that this building, which has experienced many fires before, was well sprinklered and protected. Now, I'm sure that, like uh, dozens of other buildings throughout this area over the weekend during the severe cold, that uh, there was not sufficient heat in the building, it was cold, and probably... Uh, the sprinkler system was inoperative, so that uh, when the first alarm was struck, why this fire is completely then out of control. Okay. Before we go into our q and I want to introduce our second guest that's joining us tonight. He's a lifelong fire buff who's been enthused by fire radio since the age of 11. 
and was bear witness to this fire just several days before his 13th birthday. Mike Pence, could you join us and just give us a little bit of what you viewed on that day? Mike's gonna have to unmute himself and start his video. There we go. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike. I'm Mike Pence, and I actually went to the Fed's building fire. I was 13 at the, at the time and had been listening to Philadelphia Fire Radio for about a year and a half. And it was New Year's Day, a very cold day, a very windy day. And when the, uh, the box was struck, my first guess was that being New Year's Eve, this was going to be a false alarm. And there was very little activity on the radio. When Battalion 6 arrived, he had the entire 8th floor fully involved, all the way from Diamond Street North to Susquehanna Avenue. Uh, Chief Fortunato um, didn't even step out of his car. He just grabbed his radio over the second alarm. Now, back in the day, you only heard the fire dispatch were on, on the radio. You did not hear the base side, I'm sorry, the mobile side of the radio like we do today. So when Battalion 6 gave the report, all you heard was, proceed Battalion 6, silence, Okay, Battalion 6, silence. And then all of a sudden, beep, beep, second alarm. And out went the assignment. And at that point, you had no idea what was happening. And I just think, indicated in the interview, all of these alarms were transmitted in rapid succession. So about 5.30, 20 of six, my father goes out on the front porch to look northeast from our home in Southwest Philadelphia. And the sky was just totally red. The entire sky was completely lit up. So we had a family friend over for New Year's Day that year. And off we went. So we worked our way up over to 33rd and Gerard and went over the railroad bridge over brewery, brewery Town. Well, at that point, you could see the building and it was fully involved. So we made our way north to Diamond Street and made the right to go east down toward the fire ground. And we ended up parking around 17th or 18th in Di Diamond. And we began walking down toward the building. 
And I don't think at that time anyone had ever seen the volume of fire that existed. Eventually, we worked our way over to Susquehanna Avenue. And we actually ended up in a bar. And I'll come back to that story in a moment. But at that point, you had the wind blowing out of the south, blowing mortally through the building. And the wind was so great that the fire actually burned white. It actually looked like a blowtorch. Not only did it burn white, but it whistled, much like a train whistle. And it had to have been maybe one of the eeriest things that I'd ever seen. And very frightening, very frightening. It's just, you know, hard to imagine the sheer volume and intensity of this fire. So we went into a bar to get warm. And it was interesting because, because it was New Year's Eve. Or actually, I'm sorry, it was New Year's Day, of course. And there were people in the bar reveling like nothing was going on. It was, it was surreal. And the other interesting aspect of the bar was that the decision had been made to keep the day work people over. They were not relieved at 6 p.m. And so any number of firefighters that night were not going home to dinner. And so a whole parade of fire personnel went in and out of the bar to call their wives to let them know that they weren't coming home for a while because they were being held over into the, the night shift. The B platoon had day work that day. The C platoon had worked night work. Now, if I can just have one or two more minutes just to share a couple more tidbits about this fire. What the WCAU video did not make clear was that on the Friday before New Year's, the heat was turned off in the building. It was a long week and New Year's fell on a Tuesday that year. So New Year's Eve would have been Monday and because of the long weekend, the heat was turned off. And because the heat was turned off, the spirit room, the spirit room system was also turned off as well. And this is why there was no Spindler protection in the building. Ironically, the owners of the building had just taken out a brand new fire insurance policy on Friday with Lloyds of London. So initially in the first few days following the fire, this all looked very suspicious. The renewal of the insurance, the turning off of the spring roof system, it all made you scratch your head. But, you know, it turned out not to be a deliberate fire, thankfully. <laughs> One or two more points and I'll finish. One point is that in spite of it being January 1st, this was not the first extra on fire of the year. Early in the morning, we had, 
a two-arm fire in Bagger Vision 26's station at Tenton Hamilton. It was a very long, drawn-out two-arm fire it was in a sub-basement of a bakery supply company, and they had a very difficult time getting to the seat of the fire. Engine 26 the officer had seen smoke coming from the building and he radioed the box for one. One more point and I'll finish. 1963 turned out to be the highest year up until that time for extra alarm fires. We actually ended up with 91 extra long fires, which surpassed the previous record of 84 extra long fires in 1956. I look back at this year, and I think this was really the beginning of the war years where the number of extra long fires really began began to ratchet up quite a bit. I look at 63 as the year that it started. One foot point and I'm out. There was one injury in the fire. Mm -hmm. It was George Hink. He fell on ice and broke his wrist. A fireman came over and said to the Chief Hank, what can I do, sir? And Chief Hank replied, spread some salt. Thank you very much. It was quite an honor to be able to participate this evening. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Mike, for all that information. <laughs> At this time, we would like to open up our Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can put them on, on the platform and Lisa will read them for either Mike Pence or Mike Hank. And Mike Hank, I, I have a question for you. How long, because uh, I don't know if any, any of our viewers caught that, that uh, George Hank was your grandfather, but your father. Yes, yes. my father. My father was a battalion chief um, when he was forced by injury to retire in 1965. He went on the uh, department in 1946, right out of World War II, and um, he loved it. He, my, my father would have probably done it for free. <laughs> he loved the job, <laughs> loved the job. So he was following in his father's footsteps, and unfortunately, he got hurt, and he went out on service-connected disability. I have, I have to, one quick thing here. I have to, uh, when, when my grandfather broke his wrist, it was in 1964 at a fire down on Strawberry Street. He, when he fell at the Fred's fire, he banged his head on the ground and he said, get rock salt and put it on anything that shines, was his, was his quote. <laughs> but yeah, he broke his wrist at a different fire, Mike. Mike, okay. and, Mike and Mike, we have a question. Um, what okay. was the first unit on the scene? First First in is engine two, ladder three, and battalion six. They went north on 7th and west on Susquehanna. And as soon as they made 10th Street, they saw the inferno that they had on their hands. Um, it was a quick minute and a half uh, ride for them, and they knew that building was born right then and there. They had a uh, four alarm fire there in 1959. In May, yeah. Yeah, which I have pictures of it, but I can't find the pictures. But it was, it wasn't nothing like this. It was, it mm -hmm. was uh, just some fire showing on the upper floors, but the sprinkler system controlled that. If I can make one more comment about Mike's father. And that in the mid 50s, his father was the chief of the special services unit of the Philadelphia Fire Department. And it was in that period 
that the department acquired SS-99, the light wagon, the, the, um, the three chemical units, the air compressor, the mobile hospital, all of that special equipment was under Mike's father's command uh, in the mid 1960s. Yeah, he was he was captain of S of special services in the right. 50s. Yep. And then he left there and went to Engine 28, and then after that he became a battalion chief. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Questions? So my, we have. Oh, my, sorry, we have we have one more. Was any equipment damaged from the falling walls? That's a good question, Mike. I, I don't, I don't know anything about that. You might know that. I don't know that any equipment was. I mean, it's a very interesting question for the following reason: a week or uh, twelve days later, we had the fire at St. Elizabeth School at Twenty Second Montgomery. And had that fire flown wall had killed two Philadelphia firefighters and actually did damage two pieces of apparatus. The old ladder one, I think they're Max and McGarris, uh rear mount aerial ladder was destroyed. And I think maybe a 49. American or France, um, maybe I seem to recall that it was ladder 18. Yeah. yeah, I think it was ladder 18 and ladder 22. Oh, well, they, were, I, yeah, they, were, I, they were parked on Montgomery back to back, front to front, and the wall came in on them. Yep. Yeah, Two guys. Yeah, got these, yeah these were stone walls yeah. at St. Elizabeth. And in fact, there was still demolition equipment on the fire ground at Tenth and Diamond. And uh, Mike's grandfather was aware of that. And he actually ordered that that equipment be relocated uh, yeah. to 22nd and Montgomery that night uh, to begin lifting this heavy stone that had, fall, that had fallen down when these big stone walls had collapsed um, that night. I mean, it was kind of horrifying that all of this happened within just less than two weeks. Um, you know, it, it, it was a terrible, terrible time. Mike, what was, was. The, um, what was the original um, use of the Fretz building at the time of the fire? There, there were 14 different occupants at the time. Uh, there, I, I have new articles. There was mayonnaise, to, uh, men's suits. Uh, a lot of different things were manufactured in the building. Yeah, it was mixed occupancy throughout. And there was all kinds of material that uh, contributed to the fire load that night. But I think at the end of the day, it's fair to say that what really did the building in was its construction. It was all wood for, it was all wood joists. And given the age of the building, one can only surmise that all of that wood was very much dried out by this point in time. I think the building was built Maybe just before 1920. I used to know that. Like 1901. Yeah. 1901. I knew and so, you know, over the course of 60 years or so, yeah, plenty of time for that material to dry out. And it was just tender by, by this time. Mike, we had um, talked about this before the program started. We have a question about what is on this location now? I well, think, well, I'm, go ahead. Yeah, I, I told Mike and Lisa, I remember going by there about 20 years ago. In fact, it was right around the time that Mike and I first made contact 
with each other. And my recollection is that some kind of a playground is sitting on the northwest corner of Denton Diamond. And I think this was to be going out to 11 and 12. I think it's now athletic fields that belong to Temple University. Or at least yeah, that Temple owns the property, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This this question is is from Mike Hink. Mike, which with, with your father being a battalion chief and your grandfather going up to the rank of commissioner, you were never interested in coming on to the fire department? We we moved out of the city when I was 10. Um and I, I think maybe if we had lived in the city as I became an adult, I might have gone that direction. Um, I had a real love for uh, it was just an exciting time with my father and, and our grandfather and, and, and the house we lived in. It was just nonstop. We had the two way radio in the house, the fire phone, all that's the Joker bells from way back in the day. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I might have done it. I don't know. I don't know if I could have handled the heights. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, do climb the ladders. Lisa, do we have any other questions? Uh, not, not right now. If anybody would like to um, raise their hand and ask a question live, we could let you talk. Uh, if you don't want to type the question in, um, take your opportunity now to ask. Raise your hand. Hey, my son's you. watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's I'm not seeing any more. And my questions. brother, I know my brother's in here someplace. Um, um, I, I want to thank uh, both of my guests tonight. Thank you very much uh, for giving your, your your views on what happened tonight. Thank you, Mike, for sharing this video. This is this is history, and now we have it as uh, archival purposes in in, in the museum. Uh, for all my viewers uh, joining me, joining us tonight, thank you very much. This will. Uh, end our membership meeting until November of this year. So if you know a friend or a family member that would like to come down and be a member, please direct them to our, our, our website or just come down to the museum. It's free. And if I could uh, just say to all of our viewers, please follow us on all our social media platforms. And if you're not a member, please come down and get and become a member. Thank you very Thank you, much. Brian. Thank you so much, Lisa, Brian, Mike Pence, everyone. Thank you. Until next, time. Until next time. And for all my viewers, you can also follow us on social media and watch the Curator's Corner, which airs from September to May. Again, and until next time. Thank you. Welcome.